بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome everybody to the beginning of our course pertaining to getting excited for Ramadan, getting ready for Ramadan and learning as much as we can before the blessed month comes upon us. Whoever witnesses the month of Ramadan, then they are truly going to be a person that is blessed because being alive during the time of Ramadan as a believer is one of the greatest blessings that can be bestowed upon us. There are so many in their graves now that are literally they would do anything to live another Ramadan due to the amount of rewards and opportunities that are contained within this month. So it's imperative that we take heed and we try our best to learn about the month so we can make the most and maximize the benefits of this month. The Prophet ﷺ himself, he used to give glad tidings when Ramadan would come close to his companions and he would encourage them with regards to making the most out of the month, using every moment to the best of their ability to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ described the month in so many different ways that when you read these ahadith and you ponder and reflect upon the ahadith, you cannot help except to get excited for the month and beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow you to live it. So reading and reflecting on such a hadith and statements of the scholars pertaining to their meanings is something which is very important prior to the month of Ramadan. And that's what we're doing inshallah. So we have the first hadith which is collected by Imam Ahmed and Shaykh Al-Albani in Tamam Al-Minna. He authenticated it. Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu, the great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, قال لما حضر رمضان قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم that when Ramadan was coming close, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said to his companions قد جاءكم رمضان شهر مبارك افترض الله عليكم سيامه that verily Ramadan has come upon you, a blessed month and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the fasting in this month obligatory upon you تفتحون في أبواب الجنة in this month the gates and the doors of the heavens all of them are opened وَيُغْلَقُوا فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ And all of the gates of the hellfire are closed. وَتُغَلُّ فِيهِ أَشَيَاطِينَ And the devils, they are chained and locked up. فِيهِ لَيْلَةٌ خَيْلٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٌ مَنْ حُرِمَ خَيْرَهَا فَقَدْ حُرِمْ In this month, there is a night which is more better and virtuous than a thousand months of worship. Whoever is prevented from its good, then for sure this person is in a loss and has been prevented from much loss. Imam Ibn Rajib al-Hanbali, may Allah have mercy upon him, in his book, Al-Ta'if al-Ma'arif, when reflecting upon this hadith, he said some scholars have said that this hadith is a proof for giving glad tidings to one another pertaining to the closeness of the month, pertaining to the month in itself. And he said, how can it not be that the believer is given glad tidings with regards to the month, knowing that the gates of Jannah are open? You know when the gates of Jannah are open, it's as though only good deeds are going up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging us to race through those gates of Jannah. It's encouraging us to take it seriously that the gates of Jannah are now open for you. Do whatever you can and come forth. So Imam Ibn Rajab, he also said, how could it not be that the sinner is not given glad tidings, knowing that the gates, knowing that the gates of the hellfire are closed? If the gates of the hellfire are closed, it's as though we are being told this is an easy time for you not to commit sins. You should only be focusing on good deeds. He also said that Imam, how can the intelligent person not be given glad tidings knowing that the devils, they are chained up? And he said, where, where is there a time which is even close in similarity to the time of Ramadan? It's such a special month. With regards to giving glad tidings, some people they feel that there's specific words that you have to say, specific phrases. No, there's nothing of that sort. Rather, it's just that, you know, there's excitement which is built up and amongst your loved ones and your friends, you just encourage each other uh, with regards to being as active as you can in the month of Ramadan in seeking its blessings and rewards. One may wonder after hearing the hadith that we mentioned that if the devils are chained up, then why is it that some people are still doing evil? and some places you still find evil taking place in those places. The scholars, they had a variety of answers to this question that is posed by people. The first of the answers is that not all of the devils are chained up. It's only the major 
leaders of the devils that are chained up by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month. Another opinion that they gave, another answer that they gave is that these people that do evil, they themselves have become like little devils. Their souls have been trained for the past 12 months in doing evil. That's why they themselves are unable to stop because they themselves have become like devils. And the third thing they said, that the reality of the devils being chained away is that they are chained away only from those who are observing the fast in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to observe the fast. In this month, there's so many opportunities to gain rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So many opportunities to gain the mercy of Allah subhanahu So many opportunities to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So many opportunities for us to change our lives to become better believers. However, in order for us to benefit from the, from the month of Ramadan, we must have sincere intentions and we must have a strong desire, a feverish desire to change, a feverish desire to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must have the outlook that we're going to use Ramadan as a springboard to get closer to Jannah and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Bukhari Muslim, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in this very popular, very well-known hadith, Man sama Ramadan, imanan wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbihi. Whoever fasts Ramadan with iman and ihtisab, then all of his sins are going to be forgiven. وَمَنْ قَامَ لَيْلَةَ الْقَدْرِ إِمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ And whoever stands the night of Laylat al-Qadr, the night of power, the night which is more than a thousand months equivalent of worship, then their previous sins will be forgiven. And in another narration uh, pertaining to the same hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, وَمَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانٍ إِمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ And whoever prays the night prayers in the other nights of Ramadan then this person's sins are going to be forgiven. So you heard me mention in the hadith, the two words, imanan wa ihtisaban. What this means is that the Prophet Sallallahu is telling us that whoever fasts a month out of iman, meaning that this person has a belief in the obligation that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has put upon them regarding fasting the month of Ramadan. They do it understanding that this is an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They fast knowing that it's a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are happy to submit to the command of Allah azza wa jal. So these people, they don't do it habitually like some people do, just because the culture says that we have to fast, or just because their family is fasting. Right? They do it out of submitting themselves to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also the second word which recurred in the hadith was ihtisaban. That whoever fasts Ramadan, whoever stands the nights of Ramadan, whoever stands the night of Laylatul Qadr with ihtisab, then this person's sins are forgiven. What is ihtisab? Ihtisab is that you have expectancy from the, in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You expect and hope and expect from Allah azawajal that he's going to forgive you, that he's going to accept your deeds, that he's going to raise you in rank, that he's going to bring you closer to Jannah, that he's going to answer your du'as. You have this uh, deep expectancy of hope and uh, the reward in the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you, meant, you saw in the hadith that the Prophet sallallahu was saying that whoever fasts Ramadan with this iman and this ihtisab then their sins are going to be forgiven. And if it's the case that, Ramad, that the fasting was not enough somehow for your sins to be forgiven then we also have in the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever stands the, lay, the night prayers in Ramadan, in Taraweeh or in the night prayer, then this person is also going to have their sins forgiven. And there's a third opportunity also for your sins to be forgiven, which is that the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever stands the night of the Laylat al-Qadr, Laylat al-Qadr, the night which is more than a thousand months equivalent of worship, will also have their sins forgiven. So there are so many opportunities to have your sins forgiven in the month of Ramadan. And of course, there's other acts of worship that we will talk about as we go through the thoughts of this lecture. Somebody may be thinking to themselves, well, I find it difficult to fast. I find it difficult to get up for the night prayers. I find it difficult to read the Quran and to give sadaqah and to do all these things. Don't worry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't made these things obligatory upon you or recommended upon you so that you will suffer. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do these acts of worship so that you benefit and that you change your life for that for the better. And we should be willing to sacrifice, we should be willing to strive. Because what is the reward? The reward is the possibility, the great possibility of entering into, the, entering into paradise, entering into Jannah. 
the life which is for billions and billions of years, the life which never comes to end. So you strive just for a few years in your life and you end up being rewarded by Allah Azawajal for a never ending life. That is a bargain which you will never find, that is a trade which you will never find equivalent to. So we shouldn't be worried, rather we should beg Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to help us and we should remember the rewards. And the reason that some of us are worried and the reason that some of us we find, uh, or most of us do in fact, that we find worship difficult or certain acts of worship difficult is because we are like the pizza addict, the person who's overweight, obese due to eating so much pizza. They're addicted to pizza and junk food. And now this person, when they're told that you have to go to the gym and you have to change your diet and your lifestyle, the first few weeks in the gym, it's torture for them. They can't handle it. It's so difficult because they've been eating non-stop junk food. They're pizza addicts. But the more they continue in the gym, the more they continue with their diet, the more they focus on the goal, they soon start to realize how beneficial this new way of life is for them. They soon start to find that the workout that they're doing is getting easier and easier. And they start to push themselves more and more. Likewise in the worship, we are overweight and obese with regards to our sins and our laziness. But the more that we practice, the more we try, the more we beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more we seek knowledge, the more we implement the knowledge that we learn, then we are like that overweight person that goes to the gym. And after a few weeks of the gym regiment, the gym regime, the gym routine, they get better and healthier. Likewise, our souls will get better and healthier in the month of Ramadan if we make the effort that we are supposed to make. Sadly, there are some in the month of Ramadan that won't achieve much. And we have to be aware not to be like them. Because the Prophet wasallam once, he was uh, saying, Ameen. And the companions, they were saying to him afterwards, you said Amin out of the blue. Why did this happen? He said that the angel Gabriel, the angel Jibreel came to me and he said to me three du'as and he said to them, and I said Amin to each of them. The first of these du'as was that the Prophet ﷺ said, رَغِمَ أَنْفُ رَجُلٍ ذُكِرْتُ عِنْدَهُ فَلَمْ يُصَلِّ عَلَيَّ قُلْ Amin. The Prophet ﷺ, it was mentioned to him that May the person be humiliated who my name is mentioned in front of him and they do not send a salah upon me. They, don't, they do not say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or anything similar to that. And also the one which is pertinent to our thoughts and our lecture is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said And may this person be humiliated who lives to see the opportunity, who lives to have the blessing of Ramadan given to them however Ramadan leaves them and they haven't been able to have their sins forgiven this person truly deserves to be humiliated and also the Prophet ﷺ said in the third one that may, may this person be humiliated who has both of his parents grow in old age uh, whilst he's around and he's unable to see, seek the mercy of Allah through serving them meaning that he had the opportunity to seek the mercy of Allah through serving his parents, but he was unable to obtain that. So going back to the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that may the person be humiliated who is given the opportunity to live Ramadan and however Ramadan leaves them and they haven't changed their state. They haven't been forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They haven't improved in their iman and their acts of worship. This is something that we have to be aware of from the outset that we don't want to be like this person. This is the person that didn't try hard. This is the person that didn't focus. This is the person that didn't plan the month of Ramadan. What are they going to do? This is the person that didn't read or listen too much about the rewards. Whereas a person who does try, then for sure they're going to get forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, it's impossible to think that they will not be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month. The Prophet sallallahu said in part of the hadith collected by Imam Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah and Shaykh al-Albani rahmatullah alayhi, he said it's authentic. He said, That every night of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be freeing people from the hellfire. Meaning that there were people that were destined to go to the hellfire, but because they did so much acts of worship in the month of Ramadan, then every night Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is freeing an amount of people that were destined for the hellfire. So the month of Ramadan is a month of mercy. A month where you have opportunity to be freed from the hellfire. A month where you have the opportunity to change yourself. A month where you have the opportunity to come closer to the ultimate goal, which is to enter into paradise. In this month, 
the du'as are answered more than in any other time. And du'a in general, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us in the hadith in Tirmidhi, authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani, that inna Allah hayyun kareemun yastahi ida rafa'a rajlu yadayhi ilayhi an yaruddahuma sifran khaybatayn. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so generous. He is so generous and he is so shy that if a person raises their hands to him making du'a, they raise their hands making du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah is shy to return the hands of that person empty-handed by the time they have finished the du'a meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to answer the du'as of the people so this is an encouragement in all times that we should be making du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala however what is interesting is that if you look to Surah Al-Baqarah and you ponder the verses pertaining to the regulations of fasting uh, around verses 180 something you will find in the middle of these verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ If my slaves ask you O Muhammad pertaining to me then tell them that I am close to them أُجِيبُوا دَعْوَةَ الدَّاءِ إِذَا دَعَان I answer the call of the one who is calling upon me فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So let them respond to me and let them believe in me perhaps and in the hope that they will be guided so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that he is close to us or in terms of his knowledge and his uh, ability uh, and that he is answering our du'as so this being sandwiched between the verses of the regulations of Ramadan shows us that the fasting person one of the gifts that they have the fasting person is that their du'as are going to be answered and this is further established in the hadith mentioned collected by Ibn, Ibn Majah may Allah have mercy upon him with the Prophet said inna li su'im in the fitrihi da'watun la turad that the Prophet said that verily the fasting person has at the time of them breaking their fast an opportunity to make dua which will never be rejected that when you are breaking your fast and you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your dua is not going to be rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why? think about it the whole day you have been worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal, the whole day you've been abstaining as an act of worship from food and other matters, the whole day you've been reading Quran, reciting dhikr, doing acts of charity, trying to improve yourself, making dua. So all of these acts of worship, they culminate at the time of you breaking your fast by you having the opportunity to make dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarding you with a dua that is going to be answered. And this is something we should remember in general as a side point that the more you do from the acts of worship and the more you correct your belief, your aqidah, then your dua is more likely to be answered. It's like some of the scholars, they said, imagine a person with a bow and arrow. So the person has a fantastic, uh, very well designed bow and arrow. However, their arm is very weak, so the arrow is not going to be traveling very far. Whereas if the arm of the person is strong, the arrow will go far. So your arm is your belief and your worship. The more you have correct belief and correct worship, the more you are likely to have your dua answered. And so this is the case of the one who is fasting Ramadan after having done all so many acts of worship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows the person to have an answered dua. One of the major blessings of this month is that this is the month wherein the Quran was revealed to mankind. The uncreated speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the final revelation to mankind was revealed in this month. Wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Baqarah, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ أَلَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنَ هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانَ That this is the month of Ramadan wherein the Qur'an was revealed to mankind in order to guide them and to give them clarity pertaining to guidance. The Qur'an is full of guidance. It's full of that which benefits us spiritually. It's full of that which benefits us mentally. It's full of that which benefits us even physically. It's a cure for all of our ailments, whether they are spiritual ailments or whether they are physical or mental ailments. The one who lives by the Qur'an will find that their life will be full of blessings. And we need to use this month as a platform, as a springboard to reconnect to the Qur'an, to reattach ourselves to the Qur'an, to seek to recite it regularly, to seek to understand it, to seek to live, to seek to live by its commands. We need to be as we are with our gadgets. Our gadgets are always with us. Every few moments we hear the ping and we look to the gadget. 
This is how we're supposed to be with the Quran. That every so often throughout the day, we have a feeling of need to be with the Quran, to be with the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we can be guided by the Quran, so that we can find tranquility in the Quran. One may worry that, okay, this is the month of the Quran and I want to be with the Quran. I want to reconnect to the Quran. However, I find it difficult. I find it difficult reciting the Quran. First of all, we have to ask ourselves, why do we find it difficult? Is it because we haven't been investing enough time with a teacher to learn how to recite the Qur'an? Had we invested a year or two years or three years, our recitation would have been proficient enough for us to enjoy the Qur'an. So we need to invest more time with the Qur'an in terms of learning how to recite it and learning the language of the Qur'an so that we can connect to it in the way that we are supposed to connect to it. However, if you find the Qur'an difficult upon you to recite, then don't worry, there's still reward for you, there's still... Uh, opportunity for you to benefit from the Quran. The Prophet وسلم, said in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha, who said that the Prophet وسلم, said, Alladhi yakra al-Quran, Alladhi yakra al-Quran, wa huwa maahihum bihi, ma'a safarat al-kiram al-barara. The one who reads the Quran, and th- this person is proficient in reading the Quran, then this person w- is with a special group of angels. Meaning that in virtue, this person is with a special group of angels because of their proficiency of reading the Quran. However, the person who reads the Quran and finds that they stutter and they trip over the words of the Quran and it's difficult upon them, then don't worry for this person still gets two rewards. One reward for reading the Quran and a second reward for having patience with the difficulty that they are facing when it comes to being with the Qur'an. So nobody loses out with the Qur'an. Nobody loses out with the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards everybody immensely if they are willing to spend time with the Qur'an, whether it's easy for you, whether you are proficient with it, or whether you find difficulty with it. The more you stay with the Qur'an, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for you and give you blessings because of that connection you are establishing with the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every moment you spend with the Qur'an, your deeds are shooting up. Your scale of deeds are getting heavier and heavier. Every moment. Listen to this hadith collected by Imam Tirmidhi where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man qara'a harfan min kitabillahi ta'ala Whoever recites a letter from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala falahum bihi hasana Then this person has for each letter a hasana, a good deed. The Prophet ﷺ said, وَالْحَسَنَةُ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا And a good deed is rewarded ten times or more. Every good deed that you do is rewarded ten times or more. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, لَا أَقُولُ أَلِفْ لَا مِيمْ حَرْفْ وَلَكِنْ أَلِفُ الْحَرْفْ وَلَا مُنْ حَرْفْ وَمِيمُ الْحَرْفْ And he said, I'm not saying to you that when you recite this word in the Quran, أَلِفْ لَا مِيمْ that this is considered a letter. Rather, Alif is a letter for which you get 10 rewards or more. Lam is a letter for which you get 10 rewards or more. Meme is a letter for which you get 10 rewards or more. So by the time you've recited Alif, Lam, Meme, you have 30 rewards or more. Nobody loses out with the Quran when they recite the Quran as long as they are learning how to recite it properly, as long as they are trying to implement it in their life, and as long as they are trying to uh, make it change their hearts. So these rewards, are in normal circumstances. However, imagine in the month of the Qur'an, the month of Ramadan, the month where deeds are multiplied in their blessings and their virtues and their rewards. The more you strive in the month of Ramadan to be with the Qur'an, the more your soul will be cleansed, the more your heart will be attached to the Qur'an. And then we will find tranquility and comfort in being with the Qur'an. And it will be something that we will become addicted to, something that we will need in our lives something that we will feel very lonely without. Uthman radiallahu anhu, he said, لَوْ طَحَرَتْ قُلُوبُنَا مَا شَبِعَتْ مِنْ, كلام, من, من, من كلام الله. This great companion radiallahu anhu, he said, if our hearts had been pure and our souls had been pure, then we would never have had enough of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَوْ طَحَرَتْ قُلُوبُنَا مَا شَبِعَتْ مِنْ كَلَامِ الله. We will never have had enough of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more we purify our hearts, the closer we are going to be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There will be times when maybe you get tired from, listening to the, from reading the Qur'an. Then what you can do is you can listen to the Qur'an. The more you listen to the Qur'an attentively, you are also being rewarded. 
in an immense manner. Because listening to the Quran is very similar to reciting the Quran in terms of reward. In fact, many of the scholars, they would give preference to listen, listening to the Quran attentively over reading the Quran because they would say that you can make tadabbur more, you can make more reflection upon the Quran in that manner. However, the general consensus is that to read it is the most virtuous thing to do. One of the comprehensive ahadith pertaining to Ramadan is the one that we're going to take now. We'll take it bit by bit inshallah. It's narrated in Bukhari and Muslim by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. It's a hadith Qudsi where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that all of the actions of the son of Adam, meaning the worship that he does, is for him, except for fasting. That is, uh, that is specifically for me, Allah says, and I will reward it in my own specific way. What does this mean, this part of the hadith? It means that because fasting is such a sincere act of worship done to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's sincere because nobody knows the reality of your fast. Nobody knows if you're truly fasting. You can easily sneak a snicker bar if you wanted to do so. You could easily sneak a sip of water. But of course you're not going to do so because you want the reward from Allah Azawajal. So nobody knows the reality of your fasting except Allah Azawajal. And that means it's at the peak of sincerity. Because you know that you can cheat but you're not going to do so. You're only doing it solely for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And because it's solely for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, because of that sincerity and that care that you have in your act of worship, then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is going to reward the worship in a special manner. Okay? From this special protection and reward of your fasting is that on the Day of Judgment there will be a group of people that have wronged people in life. They oppressed people, they did wrong to people. That These people on the Day of Judgment, before they can enter into Jannah, if they will enter into Jannah, they have to give recompense. There has to be judgment between them and the people that they wronged. So they will have to give from their good deeds as a recompense to the people that they wronged. They will have to settle the accounts, so to speak. And it will be the case that for some of them, they will lose all of their good deeds. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow the fast to be touched as a good deed to be given a recompense. Imam Bayhaqi in Sunan al-Kubra, he narrates, he collects from Sufyan ibn Uyayna, this great imam, this great scholar, who said that إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يُحَاسِبُ اللَّهُ عَبْدَهُ وَيُؤَدِّ مَا عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْمَظَالِمِ مِنْ سَائِرِ عَمَلِهِ That if it's the day, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give hisab, will give account for some people that were wronged. He will take from the oppressor the good deeds and give it to the one that was oppressed. Okay? Uh, there will be no deeds left for that person because he oppressed so much he had to give all his, all his good deeds away. The only deed that he will have left is the fasting. فَيَتَّحَمَّلُ اللَّهُ مَا بَقِيَ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْمَظَالِمِ وَيُدْخِلُهُ بِصَوْمِ الْجَنَّةِ But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep that good deed of fasting, not allow it to be touched in this, ma in this matter of uh, settlement. And eventually after the person is uh, punished and sent into the hellfire, if they are destined to go to the hellfire, then they will eventually enter into Jannah based upon the forgiveness of Allah and based upon the virtue of the fasting that they did. All of this to show that the deed of fasting in Ramadan has a special status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also pertaining to this part of the hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it is for me and I'm going to reward it in a special way we know that most deeds they are rewarded from 1 to 100 up to 700 times okay it's mentioned in different narrations uh, different rewards for different deeds however the reward for fasting has not been mentioned anywhere by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of its levels of hasanat Okay, and this is because the ulama, they said that this is a special deed in Allah's estimation and he's going to reward it in a special way. The next part of the hadith that we're taking, the Prophet ﷺ said, As-siyamu junnah, was-siyamu junnah. That fasting is a junnah. Junnah is a shield or some type of armor that a person wears when they go to, into battle. So this fasting is a protection for you. It protects you from harm and the greatest of harms, which is the hellfire, due to the huge rewards which are contained in fasting. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith collected by Imam Ahmad, authenticated by Sheikh Al-Albani in Sahih Al-Jami'ah, 
that the Prophet ﷺ said, الصيام جنة يستجن به العبد من النار That fasting is a shield which the person uses to protect themselves from the hellfire. The reason they are able to protect themselves from the hellfire is because through fasting, they are disciplining their soul to become a better worshipper. Right? If you are able to abstain for 15 hours or so from the fundamental needs of a human being, the eating and drinking and sexual intercourse, then these are fundamental needs and they are halal needs. If you are, ala- if you are able to abstain from them for around 15 hours or more for the sake and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then after a month of doing that, you will be able to abstain from the minor things which are haram upon us the few things which Allah has made haram upon us, you will be able to abstain from them in an easy way. It won't be difficult for you. Because now after 30 days, you've trained your soul to be able to stay away from the haram. And this is the greatest of the objectives, to protect yourself from falling into the displeasure of Allah Azza And this is what fasting trains you to do. A whole month of training to abstain, to, per- to train the soul, to be able to tell the soul to stay away from certain things, uh, which will lead you to harm. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Baqarah pertaining to the verses of fasting. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum usiyam kama kutiba ala ladhina minum qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe, fasting has been made obligatory upon you as it was made obligatory upon those before you. Why? So that you may increase and develop taqwa. Taqwa is that you are aware and very careful of abstaining from that which is going to harm your religion abstaining from that which is going to lead you to the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we fast the Ramadan, as, as the Prophet said, as-siyamu jannah, that the fasting, it is a shield from the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to come out of the month of Ramadan, a changed person, a changed believer, being closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and having more control over the state of our souls. The Prophet said in the next statement, وَإِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ صَوْمِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَلَا يَرْفُضْ وَلَا يَسْخُبْ وَلَا يَسْخَبْ The Prophet said that if it's the day when you are fasting, if you are fasting, then none of you should make rafath and none of you should make sakhab. Yarfuth, mentioned in this hadith, is to have vile, lewd speech. And yasqab is to have aggressive speech which leads to argumentation. So when the person is fasting, they have to be in control of their demeanor. You cannot be that person that says, oh man, I'm having a really hard day because I'm fasting. So I'm going to take it out on my spouse. I'm going to take it out on my family members. I'm going to take it out on my uh, work colleagues, etc. No, you have to be in control. You have to be strong. You have to be, in fact, more active uh, when you're fasting. And in fact, it's very possible. Many people who do extreme sports, like many fighters, professional fighters, they find that they're more active they're able to train harder when they have less food in their stomachs. And this is a reality. The less food you have in your stomach, the more active and the sharper your senses become. So a person, when they are fasting, the Prophet is telling us that we don't use speech which is lewd and vile, nor do we use the aggressive type of speech. Then the Prophet said, فَإِنْ سَابَهُ أَحَدٌ أَوْ قَاتَلَهُ فَلْيَقُلْ إِنِّي إِمْرُؤٌ صَائِمٌ If somebody curses you, when you are fasting or they try to fight with you when you are fasting then say exclaim that verily i'm a person that is fasting what does this mean so if somebody's trying to wind you up somebody's trying to get into an argumentation with you then the first thing is you say it to yourself i'm fasting i'm fasting i can't respond in a bad way i can't respond in a like manner i have to be different i have to avoid this confrontation i have to respond in a better manner And if it's the case that the person is trying to be aggressive with you, trying to harm you, then you say to the person loudly that, look, I'm fasting, leave me alone, right? So if the person has some atoms weight of um, iman, some atoms weight of faith, when he hears that you are fasting, the person will hopefully leave you alone. The Prophet ﷺ said in the next statement, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِهِ لَا خَلُوفُ فَمُصَائِمْ أَطْيَبُ إِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ رِحَ الْمِسْكِ the Prophet ﷺ said, I swear by the one whose hand Muhammad's soul is in. I swear by the one whose soul my hand is in that the smell from the mouth of the fasting person is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the smell of musk. You know when you are fasting and your stomach has been empty for around eight hours or so, the stomach, it uh, emanating from the stomach can be a bad smell because your mouth is dry and your intestines etc are dry 
However, we shouldn't be bothered by that smell because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that smell. The Prophet sallallahu is telling us that Allah loves that smell more than a person will love the smell of musk, right? More than the smell of perfume. Why? Because it's, you're doing it, it's emanating, it's coming about due to you submitting yourself in a difficult act of worship for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it also teaches us that if there is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us to do, which is in general the acts of worship and to behave as a, as a good believer, that is what Allah loves from us, then we should also love that regarding, regardless of whether the people find it uh, displeasurable or not, right? So people find that breath to be displeasurable, who cares? We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves it, so we are also proud to be in that situation. However, if you're in a situation when your breath, your spouse, your friends, your colleagues are telling you, look, you've got a bit of a situation here, it's a bit too smelly, then in that situation you can do something like wear more aftershave and if the woman is in the house she can wear more perfume uh, to try to disguise the breath. A side, point, a side point pertaining to this part of the hadith is that some of the ulama they said that you cannot use the miswak if you are fasting and the reason they said this uh, is that not to use the miswak after midday uh, is because uh, it will take away from the smell which is emanating from the stomach and this smell is loved by Allah Azza wa Jal. So this miswak, that tooth stick that people use to clean their teeth and mouth, which is highly recommended, you are allowed to use it because no matter how much you clean your mouth, the smell is still going to be there because it doesn't come from the mouth, it originates from the stomach. The Prophet sallallahu said in the last part of this hadith, لِلصَّائِمِ فَرْحَتَانِ يَفْرَحَهُمَا إِذَا أَفْتَرَ فَرِحَا that the Prophet ﷺ said that for the fasting person, he has two situations of joy which make him very happy and pleased. When he breaks his fast, he is very happy and he's very pleased. And when he meets his Lord on the Day of Judgment, he is very pleased and happy with the reward of his fasting. So after having fasted the whole day, you are happy with the bounty of food and drink that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And you are happy that Allah allowed you to complete this act of worship in a way that pleases Him. And also when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment, then you will be immensely happy with the reward that Allah has in store for you on the Day of Judgment. The reward which will lead you inshallah to Jannah to experience never-ending pleasure. The fasting that we do and the Quran that we recite, it's going to come to us in amazing ways and benefit us in amazing ways. Imam al-Hakim, he collects a hadith which he says is authentic uh, uh, according to the conditions of Imam Muslim from Abdullah ibn Amru that the Prophet sallallahu said As-siyamu wal-Qur'anu yashfa'ani lil-abd yawm al-qiyamah that the fasting and the recitation of the Qur'an will intercede for the slave on the Day of Judgment. They will come physically or in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how they will be and they will intercede for the slave on the Day of Judgment. يقول الصيام أي رب منعته طعامه وشهوته في النهار فشفعني فيه. The fasting will say, O oh my Lord, I prevented him from his food and or her from their food and desires, so allow me to intercede for them on this day of judgment. ويقول القرآن أي رب منعته من النوم بالليل فشفعني فيه. And the Qur'an would say, Oh my Lord, I prevented this person from sleeping much in the night because they used to spend time worshipping with me, meaning the Qur'an, so allow me to intercede on behalf of this person. فَيُشَفَّعَانَ And then the Prophet ﷺ said, they would be allowed to intercede. So this is the reality of the worship that we do. Whether it be the Qur'an, whether it be the fasting, which is explicitly mentioned in this hadith or other acts of worship, all of this worship protects us in this world and it will protect us in the hereafter. Okay, it will come to protect us in a variety of different ways. So it's something that we should always focus on, is to do as much fasting as we can, and as much recitation of the Qur'an as we can. The Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the verses pertaining to fasting, he mentions in the Qur'an, describing a description of Ramadan, which is very true, apt, and pertinent. The Prophet, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, called Ramadan, ayyam al-ma'dudat. Okay? Ayyam ma'dudat. That Ramadan is just a collection of a few days, right? 
is not a long period of time. Why does Allah tell us this? He tells us this so that we don't become, you know, over worried at how we're going to fast 30 days. It's as though you're telling a small child, look, calm down, it's not going to be difficult, it's only 30 days. You'll be, over to, you'll be able to do it, you'll, you can get through it very easily. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us that it's only a few days, so take hold of it. Don't waste any moment in Ramadan, it's going to pass you by so quickly. And this is the reality of Ramadan. Ramadan passes us by so quickly, it's like a guest which visits us, an honorable guest, a guest that gives much to those who treat it with respect and in the right manner. However, this guest leaves very quickly. Just as you fall in love with the guest, the guest leaves you. So we shouldn't be from those who waste any of the days of Ramadan. We should treat Ramadan as though maybe it's going to be our last one. Maybe we won't even complete Ramadan. We ask Allah to allow us to complete it and allow us to live it, but we don't know. It's not guaranteed for us. So if we do get the blessing of Ramadan, we should focus daily on our intentions and focus daily on our determination to try our best in that day because we may never get another opportunity to live the blessed month of Ramadan. So we shouldn't waste our time in Ramadan and in fact we shouldn't waste our time at all in life. The Prophet ﷺ, sorry, Imam Ibn Qayyim, one of the great scholars of Islam, he said a very powerful statement. He said, الموت, He said, wasting your time is more severe upon you than death. Wasting your time is more severe upon you than death. Why? Because he said, Because wasting your time cuts you off from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hereafter. Because you're unable to collect good deeds because you wasted your time on the PlayStation, etc. Whereas death only cuts you off from this world and its people, right? Life has to come to an end. Whereas if you wasted your opportunity to get to the hereafter, that is a true wasting. That is something which cannot be replaced. So we shouldn't waste our time in Ramadan and we should try not to waste our time too much in life in general. طيب, from the recommended deeds which are recommended to do in Ramadan, as well as fasting, uh, the praying that we've mentioned, the reciting of the Quran, is that we should give in charity in Bukhari, the Prophet is narrated about him by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, who said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ سَلَّمْ أَجْوَدَ النَّاسِ وَكَانَ أَجْوَدُ مَا يَكُونُ فِي رَمَضَانِ That the Prophet وسلم, was described as being the most generous of people. Excuse me. And he was even more generous in Ramadan. هِنَ يَلْقَاهُ جِبْرِيلِ in Ramadan, when he would meet Jibreel alayhi salam, وَكَانَ يَلْقَاهُ فِي كُلِّ لَيْلَةٍ مِّنْ رَمَضَانِ فَيُدَارِسُهُ الْقُرْآنِ So Jibreel alayhi salam would meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam every night in Ramadan, and he would review with him the Quran. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam in general was very generous. However, in this time in the month of Ramadan, when he would meet Jibreel to review the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ was described as being more generous than a blessed wind. You know that blessed breeze that comes to you on a hot day and it just reaches everywhere and benefits everybody and everything? That was how the Prophet ﷺ was described with regards to charity. He would rush around giving whatever little he had to the people that could benefit from it. Don't be a person in Ramadan that feels I don't have enough money to give. You have something. Even if you have a pound, even if you have 50p daily, that's enough for you to gain reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give more if you can, of course. Allah azza wa jal, He doesn't look to the amount of what you are giving. He looks to what's in your heart, right? He looks to the fact that you are finding it difficult to give, but you're still going to give anyway. The pound that you give could be equivalent to a thousand, person that an a thousand pounds that another person gives because your intention is sincere, right? And Allah knows your situation. So after having fasted the, uh, fasted the day of Ramadan or some days of Ramadan, you will feel the pangs of hunger. You will be able to empathize a little bit with those who are suffering the real pangs of hunger, those who are not going to have the um, evening meal for a few days. We know that we're going to get an evening meal after fasting a day of Ramadan, but there are so many out there in the Muslim world and in the world in general that are not going to get a meal for maybe two, three days or more. So when we think about those people, we should, we should want to be like the Prophet ﷺ was described, we should want to give more Ramadan, more charity in Ramadan to get the rewards 
and to help those that are in need. Also from the charity that you give in the month of Ramadan, you can get this huge reward that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith collected by Imam Bayhaqi. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man fatara sa'im. Man fatara sa'iman aw jahaza ghaziyan falahu mithlu ajrihi. That whoever gives food for a person to break their fast with, or prepares a warrior in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their armor and their other needs that they require, then the person gets the same reward as those two. So if you give food to a fasting person, right, then you get the reward of having that person's fast. They don't lose out on their reward, but you also get the reward of their fast. Likewise, if you, pre if you prepare, if you're in a situation where the Muslim warriors are going out to do battle in defense of Islam and in defense of the people, and you help prepare them for their war, for their, uh, for their mission, uh, then you also get the reward of what they are doing. So the hadith is mentioning that if you give food and drink to a person that is fasting, then you also get the reward of that. Imagine that on the Day of Judgment. On the Day of Judgment, not only will you get the reward of your fast, but you get the reward of everybody else that you helped uh, to feed on the day that they were fasting. This is something which is, you know, it's a huge opportunity. And it's something that we should really try to be involved in. When fasting, when beginning the fast, we shouldn't miss out on the huge rewards of taking the pre-dawn meal, which is known as sahur. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith collected by Imam Ahmad and authenticated by Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Al-Albani in Sahih Al-Jami'ah, the Prophet ﷺ said, As-suhuru akluhu baraka. That eating the pre-dawn meal is baraka. It's a blessing. It will help you to gain the strength to fast the whole day. And there is reward in taking that pre-dawn meal. As-suhur akluhu baraka. فلا تدعوه. So don't leave it alone. ولو أن يجرع أحدكم جرعة من ماء. Even if it be the case that one of you has to take a sip of water, meaning that's all you can do in the pre-dawn meal is to take a sip of water. Then don't leave that. فإن الله وملائكته يصلون على فإن الله وملائكته يصلون على المتسهرين. That verily Allah سبحانه وتعالى and the angels they make a salah upon the ones who are taking this pre-dawn meal. And salah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He will mention you uh, in the heavens in a good way, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises you. And salah from the angels is that the angels, they make dua for you. So when you take this pre-dawn meal, not only is the meal blessed, but you are being mentioned in virtue by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you have the angels that are making dua for you. However, don't eat too much. Keep it as light as possible so you don't harm yourself. Uh, in the month of Ramadan with regards to eating. As you pace yourself through the month, having done so much, so many acts of worship, you have to ensure that you are ready for the last 10 days in particular, the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Because in these last 10 nights, you have to make a huge sacrifice, you have to make a huge effort in order to gain the Laylatul Qadr, the night of decree, the night which is equivalent to a thousand months of worship, right? The one that the Prophet ﷺ said, Man hurima khayrahu faqad hurim. Man hurima khayraha faqad hurim. Whoever is prevented from its good, then this, perverse, then this person has been prevented from all types of good. So the Prophet ﷺ in Bukhari al Muslim, as narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha, Kana Rasulullah ﷺ ya'takifu al ashr al awakhir min Ramadan hatta tawafahu Allahu azza wa jal. That the Prophet ﷺ, it was from his habit and his custom that the last 10 nights of Ramadan he would make i'tikaf. That the Prophet ﷺ would seclude himself from his family and the people and he would be in the masjid only to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet ﷺ knew the virtues of these last 10 nights. So he would focus as much as he could in seeking out the virtue of these 10 nights and in particular the virtue of the Laylatul Qadr which as we mentioned is a thousand nights or so. So from now, even from now we should start begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to live Ramadan number one and number two to allow us to gain the rewards of the Laylatul Qadr the reward of that night which is a thousand nights or more and the more we beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the more we have a strong intention then for sure Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us some of the reward if not a complete reward we have in the hadith in Sahih al Jami'ah, the hadith of Abi Darda when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said man ata فراشه وهو ينوي من أتى فراشه وهو ينوي أن يقوم يصلي من الليل whoever 
at the time of going to sleep has the intention that they want to get up in the night and they want to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then however this person was overcome by sleep they couldn't get up to fulfill this intention until the morning until the morning prayer comes upon them this person due to the fact that they had this strong desire this strong intention that they wanted to get up and worship Allah in the night however they were overtaken by sleep which was out of their control then this person is still going to be rewarded by Allah for the intention they will be rewarded as though they had gotten up in the night and worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so with our intentions with our determination even if we don't achieve the mark Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward us immensely inshallah I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to reach the month of Ramadan to allow us to fast it in the way which pleases him to allow us to come out of the month of Ramadan as a better believer as people who are closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and closer to the destination which we all desire which is Jannah Ameen wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any mistakes and shortcomings were from myself and shaitan